Welcome to the Introduction to Energy Economics module. After going through the material presented in this module, you should be able to 1. Grasp and understand key concepts in energy economics. 2. Understand and be exposed to some econometric evidence and stylized facts in the energy economics literature. And 3. Get a basic idea of how energy economics is modeled within a CGE modeling framework. You will then be able to access and work through the rich list of recommended readings that will further your knowledge across a wide range of energy economics topics. This is broadly how the Introduction to Energy Economics module is planned. Basic energy economic concepts, principles in statistics and methods of accounting, economics of renewable energy supply, Key econometric evidence and stylized facts in the energy economics literature. Baseline forecasting of macroeconomic and energy variables. Modeling energy within a CGE framework. The main purpose of this module is to introduce and expose students to topics on the broad spectrum of energy economics, the supply and demand dynamics involved in energy economics, along with the particular characteristics of the energy markets. How energy economics links to the economy as a whole and affects the well-being of the population. And finally, energy economy interactions and related policy aspects. The capsule on environmental policies deals directly with the environment and policies to mitigate climate change. The goals are to provide students with a set of tools to answer basic questions in energy and economics, and to be able to argue crisply and logically about these issues from an economic point of view. This section deals with basic concepts related to energy economics as well as principles, statistics, and methods of accounting. Energy economics is a part of applied economics that deals with the basic issues of assigning energy resources using economic principles, tools, and business models. It involves both microeconomic aspects of energy, including energy demand and supply, and macroeconomic aspects of the budgeting and investment of energy projects. Energy economy interactions and the policy framework of the energy sector are important aspects of energy economics. It studies the complexities of the energy sector, including different industries which are highly technical in nature, requiring some understanding of the underlying processes and techniques for a good grasp of the economic issues. Each industry of the sector has its own specific features which require special attention. Energy being an ingredient for any economic activity, its availability or lack of it affects society and consequently there are greater societal concerns and influences affecting the sector. The sector is influenced by interactions at different levels, international, national, regional and even local, most of which go beyond the subject of one discipline. It's linked to environmental economics and related outcomes. Analysis of energy problems have attracted interdisciplinary interests and researchers from various fields have left their impressions on these studies. The influence of engineering, operations research, and other decision support systems in the field of energy economics have been profound. Energy issues have been analyzed from an economic perspective for more than a century now. But energy economics did not develop as a specialized branch until the first oil shock in the 1970s. The dramatic increase in oil prices in 1973-74 highlighted the importance of energy in economic development of countries. Since then, researchers, academics, and even policymakers have taken a keen interest in energy studies, and today, energy economics has emerged as a recognized branch on its own. Like any branch of economics, energy economics is concerned with the basic economic issue of allocating scarce resources in the economy. The microeconomic concerns of energy supply and demand, and the macroeconomic concerns of investment, financing, and economic linkages with the rest of the economy, form an essential part of the work. 
Due to different challenges and issues within the energy industry, mainly related to the oil industry, the energy economics field has changed over time. This has brought different issues to the fore. In the 1970s, the focus was on understanding the energy industry, especially the oil industry, energy substitution, and to some extent on renewable energies. There has also been some focus on integrated planning for energy systems with a major emphasis on developing countries. The scope of the work expanded in the 1980s. Environmental concerns of energy use and economic development became a major concern and the environmental dimension dominated the policy debate. This brought a major shift in the focus of energy studies as well as the issue of local, regional and global environmental effects on energy use. This became an integral part of the analysis. In the 1990s, liberalization of energy markets and restructuring swept through the entire world, although climate change and other global and local environmental issues also continued. In recent years, the focus has shifted to high oil prices, energy scarcity, and the debate over state intervention as opposed to market-led energy supply. This swing of the pendulum in the policy debate is attributed to the concerns about security of supply in a carbon-constrained world. Fuels, substance burned as a source of heat or power. Energy, defined as the ability to do work or to produce heat, refers to heat and power. Energy commodity is the concept that includes both fuels, heat and power. Energy commodities are either extracted or captured directly from natural resources such as crude oil, hard coal, natural gas, and others. All energy commodities produced by primary commodities are termed secondary commodities. As energy can be obtained from various sources, it is customary to classify them under different categories. Primary and secondary forms of energy Primary energy is used to designate an energy source that is extracted from a stock of natural resources or captured from a flow of resources and that has not undergone any transformation or conversion other than separation and cleaning. Examples include coal, crude oil, natural gas, solar power, nuclear power, etc. Secondary energy, on the other hand, refers to any energy that is obtained from a primary energy source, employing a transformation or conversion process. Thus, oil products or electricity are secondary energies as these require refining or electric generators to produce them. Renewable and non-renewable forms of energy. If any primary energy is obtained from a constantly available flow of energy, the energy is known as renewable energy. Solar energy, wind, and the like are renewable energies. A non-renewable source of energy is one where the primary energy comes from a finite stock of resources. Drawing down one unit of the stock leaves lesser units for future consumption in this case. For example, coal or crude oil comes from a finite physical stock that was formed under the Earth's crust in the geological past, and hence these are non-renewable energies. Commercial and non-commercial energies. Commercial energies are those that are traded wholly or almost entirely in the marketplace and therefore could command a market price. Examples include coal, oil, gas, and electricity. On the other hand, non-commercial energies are those which do not pass through the marketplace and accordingly do not have a market price. Common examples include energies collected by people for their own use. But when a non-commercial energy enters the market, by the above definition, the fuel becomes a commercial form of energy. Conventional and non-conventional energies. Conventional energies are those which are obtained through commonly used technologies. Non-conventional energies are those obtained using new and novel technologies or sources. Based on the above discussion, it is possible to group all forms of energy into two basic dimensions. Renewability is one dimension and conventionality as the other.
In energy economics, it is important to understand the different units of measurement for different fuels and energy sources. Fuels are measured for trading purposes and to monitor processes which produce or use them. The units of measurement employed at the point of measurement of the fuel flow are those which are best suited to its physical state, solid, liquid, or gas, and require the simplest measuring instruments. These units are termed the natural units for the fuel. The term physical unit is also used. Typical examples are mass units for solid fuels, kilograms or tons, and volume units for liquids and gases, liters or cubic meters. Electrical energy is measured in an energy unit, kilowatt hour, kWh. Energy related interactions are often multidimensional in nature. The main interactions are 1. Energy trade. When energy commodities are transacted in the market, this is mainly due to factors such as gaps in the supply and demand and the difference in natural endowments in different countries. Commodities such as gas, for example from Russia to the rest of Europe, and electricity, for example South Africa power pool, are often traded and moved across borders to smooth supply and demand. 2. International Institutional Influences International institutions, for example IMF, World Bank, United Nations, etc., via different treaties, conventions, and legal frameworks that influence and regulate the trade within the energy sector. 3. Other Interactions The energy sector is influenced by interactions among countries that involve different governments and entities. The multidimensional interactions within the energy sector affect the economic activities of any economy. The energy sector uses inputs from various other sectors, for instance industry, transport, households, etc., and is also a key input for most of the sectors. These interrelations influence the demand for energy, possibilities of substitution within the energy and with other resources, capital, land, labor, and material, supply of energy and other goods and services, investment decisions, and the macroeconomic variables of a country. For instance, economic output, balance of payment situations, foreign trade, inflation, interest rates, etc. The macro level influences of the energy sector are 1. The level of economic activities and its evolution over time. 2. The interdependence of energy and other economic activities, as well as interactions among economic activities. 3. The structure of each activity and its evolution over time. 4. The technical composition and characteristics of the economic activities and their evolution over time. 5. The institutional arrangement that provides the enabling environment for different activities to flourish and its evolution. 6. Macro management of the economy and its interaction with the institutional arrangement. In energy statistics terms, the commodity flow diagram represents the general pattern of the flow of a commodity from its first appearance to its final use. When combined with actual numbers or statistics, it enables a complete accounting of energy flows from original supply sources through conversion processes to end-use demands, with all double counting avoided. By accounting for all conversion losses, this framework provides an exhaustive accounting for itemizing the sources and uses of energy. This can be used later on when constructing energy balances. This will be presented in the environmental capsule. Indigenous production is any kind of extraction of energy products from natural sources. Primary commodities are extracted or captured directly from natural resources, such as crude oil, hard coal, natural gas. Secondary commodities include refined petroleum products, for example petrol, manufactured solid fuels, for example charcoal, and gases, electricity, heat, biofuels, and any other product made from primary commodities or resources. In this subsection, we describe different energies, 
electricity, oil, natural gas, solid fossil fuels, coal, renewable, and waste. Electricity is probably the most widely used energy carrier. It is used in almost all kinds of human activities, ranging from industrial production, household use, agricultural production, commercial use for running machines, lighting, and heating. Electricity is produced as primary as well as secondary energy. Primary electricity is obtained from natural sources such as hydro, wind, solar, tide, and wave power. Secondary electricity is produced from the heat of nuclear fission of nuclear fuels, from geothermal and solar thermal heat, and by burning primary combustible fuels such as coal, natural gas, oil, renewables, and waste. After electricity is produced, it is distributed to final consumers through national or international transmission and distribution grids. The increasingly wide use of electricity is reflected by statistics. The share of electricity in world total final consumption increased from 9.4% in 1973 to 19.3% in 2018, IEA 2020, the biggest increase amongst all fuels. The recent and constant transformation of the electricity sector which includes the liberalization of electricity markets and reduction in greenhouse gases, has brought upon the importance of having reliable data on production and generating capacity, as well as on the consumption of electricity, in order to manage future development and ensure security of supply in the most efficient way. Electricity is produced as a primary or secondary product in power plants. The total amount of electricity produced is called the gross electricity production. Power plants also consume some amount of electricity for their own use. Net electricity production is obtained by deducting this amount from gross production. This net production is distributed through national transmission and distribution grids to final consumers, or transformed to heat in electric boilers or heat pumps or stored using pump storage dams. It can also be exported through international transmission interconnections to another country when an electricity surplus exists or imported when a shortage exists. During transmission and distribution, some losses occur which are caused by physical characteristics of the grid and the electricity generating system. Natural gas is comprised of several gases but consists mainly of methane, CH4. It is taken from often deep natural underground reserves and is not a chemically unique product. When extracted from a gas field or in association with crude oil, it is composed of a mixture of gases and liquids. Some of them will not be energy commodities. Only after processing does it become one of the marketable gases among the original mixture. At this stage, natural gas is still a mixture of gases, but the methane content predominates, typically greater than 85%. To facilitate transportation over long distances, natural gas may be converted to a liquid form by reducing its temperature to minus 160 degrees Celsius under atmospheric pressure. When it is liquefied, it is called liquefied natural gas, LNG. Gas liquefaction changes only the physical state of gas to liquid, but it remains primarily methane. This flow chart is simplified in order to give an overall view of the gas supply chain. Production, trade, stocks, energy sector, transformation, and final consumption are the main stages of the flow of a gas into a country. Petroleum is a complex mixture of liquid hydrocarbons, chemical compounds containing hydrogen and carbon, occurring naturally in underground reservoirs and sedimentary rock. Broadly defined, it includes both primary, unrefined, and secondary, refined products. Crude oil is the most important oil from which petroleum products are manufactured, but several other feedstock oils are also used to make oil products. There is a wide range of petroleum products manufactured from crude oil. Many are for specific purposes, for example, motor gasoline or lubricants, 
Others are for general heat raising needs, such as gas oil or fuel oil. Oil is the largest traded commodity worldwide, either through crude oil or through refined products. As a consequence, it is essential to collect the data as completely, accurately, and timely as possible on all oil flows and products. Although oil supply continues to grow in absolute terms, its share in global total energy supply has been decreasing from over 45% in the early 1970s to under 40% in recent years, IEA 2020. The oil supply chain into a country has the same stages as the gas supply chain of production, trade, stocks, energy sector, transformation, and final consumption. The flow of oil from production to final consumption is complex owing to the variety of elements in the chain. The flow diagram shown in the slide provides a simplified view of this flow, covering supply of inputs to the refinery, supply of finished products to the end user, and the petrochemical flows which interact in the process. Solid fuels and manufactured gases cover various types of products derived from coal. Primary coal is a fossil fuel, usually with the physical appearance of a black or brown rock consisting of carbonized vegetal matter. The higher the carbon content of a coal, the higher its rank or quality. Derived fuels include both solid fuels and gases produced during coal processing and by coal transformation. The table gives a detailed breakdown of primary coal products, derived fuels, solid fossil fuels, and manufactured gases. Renewable energy is energy that is derived from natural processes that are replenished constantly. There are various forms of renewable energy derived directly or indirectly from the sun or from heat generated deep within the earth. Some of these forms are energy generated from solar, wind, biomass, geothermal, hydropower and ocean resources, solid biomass, biogas, and liquid biofuels. Waste is a fuel consisting of many materials coming from combustible industrial, institutional, hospital, and household wastes, such as rubber, plastics, waste fossil oils, and other similar commodities. It is either in solid or liquid form, renewable or non-renewable, or non-biodegradable. Renewable and waste products are classified into three main groups. One, products which need to be transformed into electricity in order to be captured, such as hydro or solar, photovoltaic. Two, products which are produced and then can be input for multiple uses in the transformation and final consumption sectors, such as geothermal or solar thermal, cannot be stored in a conventional sense and therefore are products for which no stock change data can be reported. Three, products which are produced and used for multiple purposes in the transformation and final consumption sectors, such as waste, fuel wood, biogas, and liquid biofuels can be stored in a conventional sense and are products for which stock change data can be reported. Globally, we get the largest amount of our energy from oil, mainly used to produce petroleum products, followed by coal, gas, then hydroelectric power, mainly used to produce electricity. The global energy mix is still dominated by fossil fuels, Despite strong recent growth in renewable sources, fossil fuels still account for more than 80% of energy consumption. Energy statistics is the collecting, compiling, analyzing, and disseminating of data from the different energy commodities such as coal, crude oil, natural gas, electricity, or renewable energy such as biomass, geothermal, wind, or solar energy, when they are used for the energy they contain. Key sources of energy statistics are national energy balances, IEA energy balances, energy yearbooks, the OECD, BP Statistical Review, 
World Energy Statistics, and Our World in Data. Some interesting energy statistics that can be analyzed are total consumption of energy over time, share of electricity as a percentage of total consumption of energy, and international nuclear electricity production. More on this later at slide 41, Stylized Facts of Energy Economics. An energy accounting framework enables a complete accounting of energy flows from original supply sources through conversion processes to end-use demands, with all double counting avoided. By accounting for all conversion losses, this framework provides an exhaustive accounting for itemizing the sources and uses of energy. The framework is applied to each individual fuel or energy type used in an economy, and thus the energy account is essentially a matrix where each type of fuel is considered along the columns. The columns are chosen based on the importance of energy commodities in the country under consideration. Each row captures the flow of energy. The rows are organized in three main blocks to indicate the supply of energy, its transformation, and final use. The flows of energy in the energy account form the energy balance. The energy balance has three main building blocks, supply side information, conversion details, and the demand information. The supply side information captures the domestic supply of energy products through production, international trade, and stock change. The conversion section also captures information on energy used by the energy industries and transmission and distribution losses. The final section captures the energy flows available to final consumers. Energy balances provide a great deal of information about the energy situation of a country. They are also a source of consistent information that can be used to analyze the supply and demand situations of a country and with appropriate care can be used for international comparisons. According to the IAEA 2005, various useful ratios can be derived from the energy balances of a country. These include 1. The energy supply mix. As the primary energy supply comes from various sources, it is important to know the contribution of each type and its evolution over time. The share of each energy source in primary consumption, for instance, the ratio coal, oil, gas, or electricity supply in the total, characterizes the energy supply mix of a country. This share shows the diversity of the supply mix, or lack of it, in a country. 2. The share of renewable energies in supply. When the energy balance includes renewable energies, this could be examined to see the role of alternative energies in the supply mix. 3. The efficiency of electricity generation. The overall efficiency of power generation can be determined from the ratio of electricity output to energy input for electricity generation, where input and output values are available by the type of energy Efficiency can be determined by fuel type as well. This indicator can reflect how the electricity conversion is evolving in the country and whether there is any improvement in this important area. 4. Power generation mix. The power generation mix of a country can be obtained from the share of electricity production by type of fuel. The higher the concentration of power generation technology, the more vulnerable a country could be in terms of supply risk. 5. Per capita consumption of primary and final energy. These two indicators are frequently used in cross-country comparisons. The ratio of primary, or final, energy consumption to the population in a country gives the per capita consumption. Generally, per capita consumption of energy is higher in developed countries than in developing countries and this index is often used as a rough measure of prosperity. Similarly, per capita electricity or other fuel consumption could be used to see the level of electricity or fuel used in a country.
This is any kind of energy used to satisfy individual energy needs for cooking, heating, traveling, etc., or as fuels or inputs in economic production. Energy demand analysis has been influenced by oil shocks, 1970s, global warming issues, changes in the energy market operations, future security of fuel supplies, and large capacity expansion needs technological improvements, developments in computing and communication facilities, and policy-making decisions. In the academic literature, we find many approaches for forecasting energy demand. Some of them are relatively simple, easy to use, and have less sophisticated approaches, while others employ more advanced methodologies. The simple approaches are easy-to-use indicators that can provide quick insights. Such techniques are relatively less common in academic literature, although practitioners often rely on them. Four such simple indicators commonly used for forecasting are the growth rate-based method, where G is the growth rate in demand and D0 is the demand in year zero. Then dt can be obtained by dt equals d0, 1 plus gt. Elasticity-based demand forecasting. Elasticity is generally defined as this formula, where t is a period given, ec is energy consumption, l is the driving variable of energy consumption, such as gdp, value added, price, income, etc. Delta is the change in the variable. In forecasting, output elasticity or income elasticity is commonly used. The change in energy demand can be estimated by assuming the percentage change in the output and the output elasticity. Normally, the elasticity is estimated from past data or gathered using judgment. The output change is taken from economic forecasts or planning documents. The specific consumption method Energy demand is given by the product of economic activity and unit consumption, or specific consumption, for the activity. This can be written as E equals A times U, where A is a level of activity in physical terms, and where U is the energy requirement per unit of activity. These two factors are able to independently forecast, and the product of the two gives the demand. Energy intensity. As discussed in the next slide, energy intensity measures are easily calculated using the formula shown and often used to characterize and compare the energy consumption profile of countries. This is one of the most commonly used approaches to determine energy demand. Energy intensity is described as the ratio between energy consumption and economic output. EI equals E divided by Q, where EI equals energy intensity, E equals energy demand, and Q equals output. It can be interpreted as the energy requirement per unit of economic value constructed. This can be rearranged to forecast energy demand, E equals EI times Q. Using the estimates for Q for the future, and assumptions about future energy intensity, the future energy demand can be estimated. Energy efficiency is broadly defined as energy efficiency is equal to useful output of a process divided by energy input of a process. The objective of energy efficiency improvements is to reduce energy demand through better use of energy consuming devices. This is a useful ratio for comparative purposes. It is often believed that certain end-use appliances are energy efficient and do not use much energy, when in fact they do, which results in a possible misallocation, a higher demand for inputs, and consequently environmental damages. Such measurements can also be used to identify faulty or malfunctioning equipment that results in energy losses. By improving efficiency of energy utilization, energy demand could be managed along with environmental benefits.
Energy and economics are inextricably linked. Access to energy and energy security are key determinants of a country's economic growth and development. When conducting econometric research, correlation between certain economic and energy variables may seem clear, but causality needs to be carefully assessed to build sound economic theories and models, and produce both credible and useful analysis to policymakers. Structural changes in energy supply and demand, for example, switching from traditional fossil fuels to cleaner sources, especially for transportation and electricity generation, requires behavioral and preference changes. These changes have already started, but there is a long way to go to achieve long-term targets related to net zero emissions by 2050. The required transition process to achieve net zero emissions by 2050, combined with a general assessment of energy access around the world, highlights the so-called twin problems of global energy, as described in Roser, 2020. The world's energy problem today can be summarized as, without cheap, safe, low-carbon energy sources at scale, we are stuck between the alternatives of high greenhouse gas emissions and energy poverty. The first energy problem is that those that have low carbon emissions lack access to energy. In this graph, we plot access to clean fuels and technologies on the y-axis against GDP per capita on the x-axis. We see that people in very poor countries have very low emissions. On average, people in the U.S. emit more carbon dioxide in a week than people in some poorer countries, such as Ethiopia, Uganda, or Malawi, emit in an entire year. The reason that the emissions of the poor are lower is that they lack access to modern energy and technology. The energy problem of the poorer half of the world is energy poverty. The second energy problem is that those that have access to energy produce greenhouse gas emissions that are too high. In this graph, we plot the share of people with access to electricity on the y-axis against GDP per capita on the x-axis. Those that need to reduce emissions the most are the extremely rich. The focus on the rich, however, can give the impression that it is only the emissions of the extremely rich that are the problem. What isn't made clear enough in the public debate is that for the world's energy supply to be sustainable, the greenhouse gas emissions of the majority of the world population are currently too high. The problem is larger for the extremely rich, but it isn't limited to them. The Paris Agreement's goal is to keep the increase of the global average temperature to well below 2 degrees Celsius, above pre-industrial levels, and to pursue efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 degrees Celsius. To achieve this goal, emissions must reduce to net zero within the coming decades. In richer countries, where few are suffering from energy poverty, even the emissions of the very poorest people are far higher than they should be. The only countries that have emissions that are close to zero are those where the majority of the population suffers from energy poverty. But this comes at a large cost to themselves, as this chart shows. In no poor country do people have living standards that are comparable to those of people in richer countries. People need access to energy for a good life. But in a world where fossil fuels are the dominant source of energy, access to modern energy means that carbon emissions are too high. The more accurate description of the second global energy problem is, therefore, that the majority of the world population, all those who are not very poor, have greenhouse gas emissions that are far too high to be sustainable over the long run. Whilst the transition to a lower carbon economy has started in many countries, we see that in 2019, only around 16% of global primary energy came from low carbon sources. Low carbon sources are the sum of nuclear energy and renewables, which includes hydropower, wind, solar, bioenergy, geothermal, 
and wave and tidal energy. 11.4% came from renewables and 4.3% came from nuclear. Hydropower and nuclear account for most of our low carbon energy. Combined, they account for 10.7%. Wind produces just 2.2% and solar 1.1%. But both sources are growing quickly. Despite producing more and more energy from renewables each year, the global energy mix is still dominated by coal, oil, and gas. Not only does most of our energy, 84% of it, come from fossil fuels, we continue to burn more each year. Total production has increased from 116,214 to 136,761 terawatt hours in the last 10 years. To conduct good energy economics research, confront the problems of climate change, and direct an energy transition towards net zero emissions by 2050, a good understanding of energy systems and technologies, including its physical properties, supply and demand dynamics, and other stylized facts is required. Understanding the bigger picture is crucial for sound policy making, given the often delayed decision making processes, the time to build, and the long term socio economic and environmental impacts related to energy. In 2016, Cercliai, Rubio Varis, and Stern published a paper in the Energy Journal, Volume 37, Number 2, titled Energy and Economic Growth the stylized facts. They attempt to determine what robust global patterns exist between energy use and economic growth. The recent jump in adoption of renewable energy sources on the back of falling prices, growing international consensus on reducing carbon emissions, and technological spillovers will already impact how we consider some of these stylized facts. Stylized Fact 1 over the last four decades, 1970 to 2010, there has been a stable relationship between energy use per capita and income. There has been an elasticity of energy with respect to income of less than one. This implies that, one, energy use per capita will increase over time as incomes grow. Yet energy use per capita varies widely across countries despite a reduction over time in the variability at given levels of income. And whilst decoupling is evident in some developing countries, it has not changed the overall pattern. 2. Decreasing energy intensity with income and over time in terms of the global mean. 2. Energy intensity decreases as incomes grow and over time in terms of the global mean. Energy intensity declines moderately with increasing income with an elasticity of around minus 0.3. Results suggest that energy intensity declines over time simply because countries are getting richer rather than because of a shift down over time of the relationship between energy use and income per capita. 3. The growth rate of the energy intensity is negatively correlated with the growth rate of income. Also, in the absence of growth, energy intensity does not improve. Stylized Fact 2 There has been a convergence in energy intensity and the energy to capital ratio over time, both in the recent period and over the last two centuries. Both unconditional and conditional beta convergence tests are highly significant. Sigma convergence tests are strongly affected by outliers with declining economies. Removing these outliers, we find strong sigma convergence too. The results in energy intensity and the energy to capital ratio are tending to increase in less energy intensive countries. Stylized back three, the energy to capital ratio declines with higher incomes and over time with the elasticity with respect to income being a bit more negative, minus 0.4, than for energy intensity, minus 
This suggests that improving energy efficiency mostly drives the decline in energy intensity, but that there are some other factors that increase energy intensity at high income levels. Stylized fact four. The cost share of energy declines over time based on evidence for Sweden, the UK, and the US. If the elasticity of substitution between energy and capital labor is less than unity and effective energy per effective worker increases over time, then the cost share will go down. It seems likely that this characterizes the growth process. It further seems that the relative price of energy to output follows an inverted U-shaped path and the price of energy to the price of labor falls. Stylized Fact 5 Energy quality increases with higher incomes. In general, energy carriers do not decline in actual use when their share falls as an energy transition takes place. Due to the structural changes of economies, the relative importance of oil has been falling at all income levels over the past decade. Electricity generation has been one of the most important and focused aspects for parts of the overall energy system in CGE models and has attracted considerable attention from energy economics researchers. Baseline forecasting of the composition, at sub-industry level, of electricity generation has been particularly poor. The growth in renewable sources has been continually underestimated including by leading institutions such as the IEA. Major forecasting agencies, including the IEA, have started to develop multiple energy baseline forecast scenarios or pathways to allow for more flexible and credible projections. General macroeconomic forecasts, often a key driver in energy forecasts itself, are similarly subject to the pitfalls of trying to project outcomes in an uncertain world with often large policy changes and unanticipated exogenous shocks. CGE models are rarely used for pure forecasting, establishing the baseline, but rather to measure the effects of or deviation caused by a policy change or other exogenous shocks relative to the business as usual baseline. CGE modelers typically rely on expert forecasting agencies to set out plausible baseline scenarios. Two recent special journals stand out in terms of guiding energy economists as well as CGE modelers in terms of baseline forecasting. The first is the IAEE's Economics of Energy and Environmental Policy, Volume 9, Issue 1, published in March 2020, titled Symposium on Long-Term Energy and Climate Scenarios. The second is GTAP's Journal of Global Economic Analysis, Volume 5, Number 1, published in June 2020, titled Baselines for Dynamic Computable General Equilibrium Models. There are, of course, many other sources of discussion and explanation of baseline forecasting within a CGE context but these will contain most of the key references and current thinking in the field. Modeling energy and its various interlinkages in the real economy has improved significantly over the last couple of decades as the need for energy and environmental modeling has increased and more reliable data has become available. With many policies targeting a move away from fossil fuels, which has been the dominant source of energy for over two centuries, the theoretical structure of models now needs to accommodate for interfuel substitution and a more detailed description of the energy sector and its interlinkages as a whole. From a technical point of view, the most common method of modeling energy in a nested production function is the CLEM specification, but subnests within CES or ACES specifications are also widely used in CGE modeling. 
A number of standard CGE model specifications have recently been adapted or modified to accommodated energy and environmental modeling. The MMRF model of Australia introduces 1. Interfuel substitution in electricity generation using the technology bundle approach, and 2. A weak form of input substitution in sectors other than the electricity generation to mimic Clem substitution. Adams and Parmenter, 2013. The GTAPE and GDYNE models allows for capital energy and interfuel substitution and are widely used to analyze global energy and climate policy. Golub, 2013. The GTAPE power model extends the GTAPE model by introducing detailed electric power substitution and implementation of an additive CES specification in the power sector that ensures the sum of inputs sums to total output. Peters, 2016. The PEP1T model has also been recently adapted for environmental modeling but still lacks detail in its energy specification. Congratulations on working through this module. We hope you enjoyed this introduction to a field of energy economics. Please have a look at the recommended readings and literature included as part of the course material to gain a full appreciation for the depth and breadth of this field. Energy economics is a relatively young but fast-growing field of study. We have, of course, only scratched the surface and omitted many of the technical details you will need to master when conducting your own data work, research, and modeling.